Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Linda Jensen. I'm the Education Director at the Arizona Housing Coalition, and it's my privilege to welcome you to our Advocacy 101 workshop. As you know, the coalition does a fair amount of advocacy, and we consider ourselves housing advocates year round, even though we find ourselves in the legislative season right now. So we thought it would be important to talk about how to be a good advocate, especially in light of the fact that we're having a day at the state capitol next week. And I know some of you are planning to attend that, but even if you're not, this workshop is relevant for anyone who wants to take their housing expertise and turn it into an advocacy uh, voice so that you too can affect change at a local, state, and federal level. We have with us today an expert on advocacy from Tri Advocates. We have Lourdes Pena, and she's going to take us through the basics, the do's and don'ts, and then some of the priorities that we're looking at this year. Yes, well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm sorry I was not facing the camera. I was making sure my presentation was loaded and ready to go. Thanks for um, taking time of your day to engage in this. Just a little background. Um, I am a contract lobbyist with Tri Advocates. We have had a longstanding uh, relationship now with the Arizona Housing Coalition as your contract lobbyist at the state capitol. And we advocate for legislative priorities on your behalf behalf. We try to address uh, questions as they come up and really try to provide um, a voice for the membership at the state capitol and most importantly empower our members to, to have that ability to also come to the state capitol or your city council meetings wherever the advocacy may be happening to um, present your points to uh, elected officials and policy makers. So I think, um, Linda, do you want me to just get started with the presentation? That would be great. And just a, a note, Lourdes is going to stop periodically for questions, but as, as you have questions, you can put them in the chat and we'll get to them when we can and on those breaks. But also, if you would like to wait until she stops, then we can put some of you on uh, audio as well and we can have an interactive discussion. We really want as much participation as possible, but we do want to allow Lourdes time to get her information across. Yes, and we definitely want to, um, thank you, Linda, we definitely want to encourage people to engage. It's not meant to just be um, us talking to you. It's really meant to be a conversation. And also, I welcome uh, input from folks who have been engaged already. And if you have your own tips uh, of how to um you know, share with the other advocates here, please feel free to add that. We'll, we'll create a, a time for that. So we'll get started. Um, for now, I'm just going to shut off the video for this part of the presentation. But um, are you guys able to see my screen? Yes, it's good, Lourdes. Thank you. Okay, so let me make this now. Um, let's start from the beginning. One second. So um, here we just wanted to make sure that we all have the same, um, oh, one moment. I'm having a little bit of a, because I think you don't see the presentation right now. So one second. Okay, now you can see it, correct? Correct. Okay, perfect. So. Uh, and actually, I, I always like to keep this feature, but if it's an issue for folks, um, if you don't know, PowerPoint has a live translation feature that you can translate to any language. So if you're ever presenting to your group or any community group, um, you can create a live translation as you're speaking to whatever language you would like to set it up in PowerPoint. So that's what you see at the bottom here. Hopefully it's not too much of a distraction. It's translating live in Spanish. Okay, so for today's agenda, uh, we wanna focus on Advocacy 101, um, how a bill becomes a law, because again, going back to 
what we're heavily involved in is legislative advocacy, but I would like to point out that the tips and information presented today can be applied to any uh, form of advocacy at all levels of government. Um, and of course, I'll provide you an Arizona legislature overview just because of the focus there. Before we go into Advocacy 101, I do want to just share, um, to me, when you are involved in a member-led organization like the Arizona Housing Coalition, that's an indication that you're already advocating. You're likely already a very active advocate in your own space and in your own um, field. So oftentimes the best advocates don't identify as an advocate because they just see that as part of the role, as part of the job um, and their mission that they're working on. But I do like to share, you know, whether you identify as an official advocate or not, most of the time you're already doing that. And most of the time, given the work that you're doing, you do it at different levels in your internal organization, with elected officials, with policymakers, with influencers out there. So there's def different roles and levels of advocacy. So why does advocacy matter, especially when we think of advocacy in the sense of political advocacy, you know, civic in engagement farther than just voting? Why does that matter? Well, um, there's this famous quote that I think um, I can de definitely relate to and many of the clients that I work with can relate to. Um, politics can be very challenging and a lot of us like to tune it off, but just because you're not paying attention to politics doesn't mean they're not gonna impact you. So just because you don't take an interest in politics doesn't mean politics won't take an interest on you. And more often than not, it does, especially in the type of work that you are doing um, day in and day out. This photo, it's a photo from 2018. You, uh, you may remember there was a big call to action from educators across the state asking for a pay increase. And thousands of teachers and educators uh, marched out to the Capitol and this, you can see the flood of red t-shirts um, outside of the state capitol. Did it have an impact? It did. Before they came and marched out, the governor was, at the time the governor was proposing a 4% pay increase. After this march came out, the proposed and approved budget um, included up to 20% pay increase by 2020. So that was the result of engagement and active participation in the process. Okay, so um, just overview of advocacy and how do you get started, right? So first and foremost, it's, it's a way of offering guidance or advice to folks. You are all experts on your specific issues. You um, are likely very much aware of opportunities and challenges within your field, and you likely have concerns on different programs available. Uh, for, for housing, for homelessness, eviction prevention, you name it. Whatever the, the program or issue that you are actively working on, you more than likely have uh, issues, concerns, and solutions for those concerns. So the first part of advocacy is determining what guidance or what input you want to offer into the problem that you've, um, that you've uh, identified or the opportunity. Maybe you think that there's a great program that could be developed and we can easily create this to maximize uh, resources and help those in need it the most, but we just haven't you know, put that in place and put the wills into, into action. So you can provide guidance. Advocacy is meant to do that, um, to share information, to share guidance, to, to share solutions for problems. Once you identify that, then you have to communicate that. And the best ways to communicate that is either through your own personal experiences, uh, your own personal anecdotes and your insight on the issues. A lot of uh, problems come with data and stats and numbers. And sometimes those are great to tell a story. Sometimes uh, using data is really helpful to present the problem. For example, we have a housing crisis issue right now. It's very helpful to present numbers like 
what is the average income in Phoenix? What is the average rent? What is considered affordable and what's not? Those data points are can be very powerful um, and very important on how to, to deliver those. So how you communicate is a key aspect of it. I like to share that just like in lobbying and pretty much anywhere else, my style might not be your style. So you have to find your own voice in how you want to be an advocate. Just because other people use a lot of data, if that's not if that's not going to come across as genuine and, and good to you, to your point or information, it, you might not want to do a, a data heavy presentation. That said, those are key things that you should be aware of, right? And be, be prepared to answer questions when you're advocating. And third, you know, you have to engage. We are a member led organization. Member engagement is key. Uh, engagement can come in a lot of ways. And most importantly, it's meant to be a collaboration among different folks. But the key in my um, experience to advocacy is really just being persistent and, and stay engaged. More often than not, we don't get what we're asking for the first time that we ask for it. So you have to be you know, consistent, you have to stay on top of the issue, you have to um, be involved and not and try the best not to be um, disappointed when things don't go your way the first time that you tried, because more, more often than not, they won't. So we got to continue to stay engaged. So um, a great way to, especially when we're talking about policymakers, uh, legislators, in this case, you'll hear me talk a lot about legislators, but again, this can apply to any level of government, city councils, board, um, executive boards, if you're involved in a board, committee boards, internal committees. Um, the power of relationship building is extremely important, and especially when it comes to advocacy. We tend to, uh, advocacy is very much driven by, of course, issues, problems, concerns, but a lot of it is driven by trust. Who, the folks that you're talking to, do they trust you or your organization? Do they have a report with you or, do, or your organization? Do they know who you are? Um, the power of relationship is, is extremely important. When we talk about legislators, it's key and vital for you to know who your legislator is so that if you want to engage directly with them, you can reach out. But it's even more powerful when you're a trusted constituent or um, advisor to them, and they are the ones reaching out to you when they see a piece of legislation across their desk that impacts homelessness, or they see a piece of uh, legislation that talks about um, food banks and, and uh, new programs and funding, right? So when you develop those relationships, and that trust, then you really have level up to a new, new engagement where you are the one being reached out and you're the one, your phone is the one now ringing. Now, it, it takes a lot of time to get to that point and it's not always the, the goal. The goal could be just, you know, you getting informed and understanding who your uh, policymakers are. But again, relationship building, and if you think about it, it matters in every in every step of the way, in whatever level of uh, advocacy you're doing. If you're trying to do create a small new program within your organization and you need to talk to your uh, leadership team, that's advocacy. And you're going to do relationship building to get that done, right? It, it's personalities, very much um, interpersonal skills take take play here. So how can you engage? Well, this, and I will share this PowerPoint um, with, with Linda so she can distribute to all the participants today. If you, if I was to click on any of these photos, it would redirect me to different um, links. But first, uh, like I said, you need to find out who your legislator is. So you need to find out what legislative district you are, you need to find out um, who's your state senator and your state representatives. And we have that available. All that is public information. If, if we were to click here on uh, who's my legislature, legislator, 
uh, you're going to um, be redirected to a website and I can share it later, but it's a website that then you ask you to put in your uh, mailing address and then it tells you what legislative district you are. Then you go and find out um, who represents you. If you click here on how you can connect with them, uh, all 90 legislators have public phone numbers and offices that you can call and they have a live person, their assistant who's supposed to pick up. They have emails that are available to everyone that you can send information to. And then the third one in a very uh, significant way is the request to speak system. There at the Arizona State Capitol, we have a request to speak system where you can register as an individual, or if you have the green light from your organization on behalf of your organization to submit official positions on different bills that are being considered when they're moving through the process. And you can sign in from the comfort of your home and put a comment, usually no more than 300 characters, um, and put in your views and the proposal. You can support it, oppose it, or be neutral. Um, through the request to speak system, you can also do just that, speak in the public hearing and share your views on whatever legislation is being proposed. So again, here's just the other, uh, the same uh, link to who my legislator is. I just wanna add another um, way to find who your, your dis what district you're in. And if you click there, um, you can input the information. So, Generally, things to consider as we think about advocacy, do's and don'ts. Um, I, I would say the first one is just like anything else, uh, be polite, right? And um, this applies to if you're reaching out on a phone call, if you're reaching out to have a meeting with a legislator, or if you're taking it to the next level and coming to testify in a committee to express your position on a bill. Um, What's the saying? Uh, honey attracts more bees, or something. I, I don't know the saying, but basically, if we're nice, we're gonna we're gonna get better things. And think about how you like to be treated, right? If you're, if, especially if you're trying to persuade somebody, you want to come across not only respectful but very um, nice. You also need to be concise. Why do you have to be concise? Folks are getting so many inputs and so much information from so many different people on completely different topics. You could have a legislator start their morning with a meeting on K-12 education, have a meeting in the middle of the day about HOAs, have another meeting about banks, and end the meeting with homelessness. I mean, the range is so broad that they are really getting a ton of information coming their way. So when we are advocating for something, the, the best way that and most efficient way to get our message across is to try to be as concise as possible. Concise and to the point, because there's not a lot of time to waste. Usually, especially if you're having a meeting, we may be scheduled for a 30 minute meeting, but we might end up only having 15 or 10 minutes, 15 or 10 minutes to actually discuss the issue. You know, be respectful. You always have to be respectful. Um, that, and, and I think respectful not only in the sense that you should also expect to hear pushback on the issues that you're coming to talk about and the advocacy you're presenting. And you have to keep it, you know, very level headed and be aware of, okay, my goal here might not be to change their mind, but just to make sure they hear my perspective. So always be respectful. Um, you don't want to get in a place where there you would have been better off not having that engagement than going to a, a meeting to advocate. Um, third, do your homework. Um, prepare what comments you're going to be providing in advance. And part of doing your homework, know your audience. Try to do a little bit of research on who it is that you're talking to. Um, think about what the objective is of this meeting. Uh, let's pretend that you're having a meeting at the state capitol. What are the objectives? Is this just to meet and meet the legislator or is this to also get across the top legislative priorities that we're working on for the year? Um, be aware of, of who you're talking to and 
try try as much as you can to be prepared and know okay they're either going to agree or disagree with me in advance so you can kind of prep also those concise talking points to rebuttal and then the last one um just don't be intimidated by the process especially if you're coming to a state capital um, is your capital, right? This is a public uh, facility that we as constituents and citizens of the state have access to and the right to fully engage and participate in peaceful civic engagement. So don't be intimidated. I also like to say um, you like the chances of you knowing more on the topic that you're advocating than the person you're talking to are extremely high. So oftentimes we are our biggest critics and we overanalyze and overthink how we're saying things or we go into way too much detail because, well, this statement was factual, but then there's this other part that if you think about federal law, et cetera, et cetera, it gets a little more complicated. So we over, over um, think our message and, and true be told, most of the time, nobody knows on the other end, right? You always wanna be factful and truthful, but you also wanna be concise. So don't overdo it. Don't be intimidated because you're talking to elected officials. You are also an expert on your own field. So use this opportunity to showcase those expertise and um, really think of yourself as a resource. And oftentimes the folks, um, you're meeting with are very appreciative of it. Even if they don't agree on the issue, the fact that you took the time to come and express your position, it's it's something they do take very, um, very highly. And especially if you're not someone like me, who's a contract lobbyist, right? You're, you're just acting on your own behalf, taking uh, ownership of the issue. So before we go into just an overview of the state capital, I would like to now um, do open up for a few questions if, if people have questions or comments. Nothing in the chat yet, but we're open if people want to type a question or take themselves off mute and ask. I think one of the don'ts that I didn't get to show there is, um, don't become argumentative, right? You can disagree, but you can do it in a in a very um, positive and respectful way. So the point of a meeting is not to be agreeing with the person you're communicating with. You can be assertive and you can definitely get your point across, but the delivery matters and it matters a lot because you may not get um, invited again or you not you may not get another meeting if, if things don't go well with that individual. Lourdes? Yes. We have um, a question. For those communication methods you shared, email, request to speak, and phone number, are there ones that seem to be more impactful or effective? Great question. Um, I would say the most impactful ones tend to be when you have the uh, in-person contact. So meaning you do a meeting with folks. That said, each have and hold a value. So when we when we talk about the um, emails, be, be aware they get a lot of emails as well. So some members are better than others in printing their emails and reading thoroughly the emails they receive. Um, they have an assistant, but again, they get a lot of communication. So emails are really good if you're trying to, pro if you have a lot of information that you're trying to provide, or if there's a bill that you just wanna make your voice heard, you put it in the in the subject line, please support SB 1272 or whatever the bill may be that you're supporting that day. Um, the effectiveness, I would say for emails is not as um, high as if you were to call the office and ask with, you know, arrange with the, um, executive assistant a meeting with a legislator. I would say the call is a, it's a level higher than the phone or than the email, but especially if you get an actual meeting with the legislator. Then the third one was testifying in committee, the request to speak. The request to speak has two options. You can just submit your comments and position online, or you can go in person to the committee. More often than not, and I know this is gonna be shocking, but more often than not, 
the decision and the vote has been made before the committee hearing. It's, it's very rare and seldom. I mean, I, I shouldn't say it's super rare. It, it happens where you have a few legislators that they haven't decided exactly where they are on the issue. They're going to wait it out, hear the testimony from the public, and learn what the pro and the con side have to say. But more often than not, maybe not individual votes were decided, but the passage and viability of that bill has already been established before it's even put on the agenda. Public testimony, however, um, you got to remember the goal might not be to change the minds and the votes in that committee. But the value, and I think is one of the most effective ways, uh, the value of public testimony is to officially put on the record your position, to officially educate a group of legislators together, and they all hear the same message at the same time, and really to serve as a, as a, a public way, a public discussion where you bring in your expertise, and you can answer questions that they may have as well. Um, so there's not necessarily, I, I would say the most effective ones are the ones that are individual meetings, because you oftentimes deal with elected officials that have a different type of behaving in a one-on-one -on -one meeting than when they're in a committee. Political reasons, uh, you know, they have a base that they have to comply with. They might be more upfront in a one-on-one -on -one and they it's more likely that you're going to change their mind or persuade them to whatever um, your position is in a one-on-one -on -one meeting than in a public hearing. So if there's no others, we'll continue with the with the next part of the presentation. And again, this is going to be really heavy at the legislature because that's what we focus on. Um, but you know, just be aware wherever you're advocating, just understand the, the institution that you're working with. If it's with City of Phoenix, City of Tucson, get to know, um, get a little homework, on, do your homework on who the mayor, the council members are, and what the process is to engage at that level. So at the state capitol, um, the legislature is composed of two chambers. We have the Senate and the House of Representatives. We have a total of 90 legislators who are elected every two years to fill a two-year term. And they are sent to the state capitol on behalf of their constituents to deal with uh, many different policy issues. We have 30 senators. Um, so every two years we vote to elect one state senator. And we have two representatives, two from each district that we also vote every year. Right now, we have a total, the House again has 60 seats and we have a very tight margin. We have a total of 31 Republicans, 29 Democrats. In the Senate, 30 senators with 16 Republican, 14 Democrat. Just so you know, the numbers matter because in order, the majority of the bills just need a, a, a simple majority. So to pass a bill, you're always going to need at least 31 votes and at least 16 votes plus one, meaning the governor. Interesting enough, because the margins are so tight, if you have a Republican missing and it's a very controversial bill and you need all your Republicans on board because the Democrats aren't going to vote for it, you might not put it for a vote that day because it's so tight. Um, if you end up getting 30 votes because one of your Republicans didn't want to support that bill, the bill dies because, again, you need at least 30. More interesting, you might hear on the news today, as of right now, as of today, the House only has 59 members because the House came together today to do something that's very unusual. It's only happened once before in my tenure at the Capitol, and, and I've been doing this for 12 years now. They came together, Republicans and, and Democrats, to expel one of their own members. So right now, there's 59 legislators because uh, 47 legislators voted to expel uh, Republican legislator Representative Liz Harris from the Chandler area due to some 
um, misconduct that they felt that she did not uh, behave herself appropriately at the chamber and was creating, um, it was about election issues and election denying issues and hearings. So it might be on the news later today, but that said, for the next couple of days, we don't expect any controversial bills coming up for a vote because they would not have the votes. If it's a party line vote uh, for that bill, you're not going to hear it until you get that vacancy filled. So there, there's a process for that to be filled. So the state legislature, again, elected by the people every two years, their top priorities and responsibilities are the main and the only constitutional responsibility is to approve an annual statewide budget. So they get to approve and determine what and how, um, how the state will spend their revenues for state-led programs. So housing, healthcare, public education, corrections, public safety, all that type of spending, that is a responsibility every year they're supposed to do this and the deadline for that should be june 30th which is the last day before the fiscal year ends um sadly in the last couple of years they have pushed the envelope and we usually don't get a budget until june 30th or last year june 26 i believe it was so they definitely uh push close to the deadline and the reason for that again is because the margins are so tight that it's more and more become more and more difficult to get agreement on a statewide budget. Um, another thing they do, they deliberate and enact new laws, changes to existing laws. Every session, um, over 1,500 bills are introduced. Of that, typically a third actually gets signed into law. This year, I have a feeling it's going to be a lot less than a third. Uh, the legislators introduced over 1,600 bills. And so far, the governor, uh, who's Democratic governor, Governor Katie Hobbs, has vetoed the majority of the bills that have come up her way. So we, we are experiencing a divided government where you have the executive coming from the Democratic Party and the legislature, although with tight margins, still controlled by the Republican Party. So that creates a lot of interesting discussions. Questions, comments on uh, the state capitol? Lourdes, I have a question and maybe it's self-serving, but I come from one of those districts that has a mix of one mm -hmm. senator, I mean, the senator and one rep in one political party, one rep in the other political party. So is it more important for me to spend my time with the person who would most likely oppose legislation that I'm in favor of or advocate with the folks who are already on my side? Yeah, that's a great question, Linda. Um, great question. So I would say it, it depends because oftentimes and we've learned that, um, you know, at Triad the Kids, we like to say we don't take any vote for granted. We may think that, for example, I'll use um, housing. Traditionally, our housing um, champions have come more often than not from the Democratic caucus, right? So you would say, okay, do we spend more energy now convincing uh, Republican folks to become our champions? And I mean more like high spending priorities. I don't mean, you know, there's a lot of um, issues that we see eye to eye with both parties because really housing, it's, it's a vital need. It should not be bipartisan, but, but because it requires spending, typically you have, our, our champions have been folks like Senator Alston, right? Who keeps asking for more uh, um, investments to be made. So, there's two two ways of answering that. Um, one, yes, it, it would make sense to spend more time if you have limited time to spend more time and energy with the Republican who might not be as familiar with the work that you do or the issues that you're advocating for. So therefore you're educating them. That is usually the, the way to go. However, just because you have an ally doesn't mean they're gonna be um, well prepared to uh, advocate on your behalf. So there's still value in communicating and engaging with the Democrats who might support you, 
but they are they don't have the right talking points or the right data to then at, raise their voice in the rooms that we are not in, especially when they're discussing a bill and be the champion for it. So that's why there's value to still um, go and talk to folks that that are already in line with you, because although they support you, they might they support the issue. They might not be well prepared to be the best champion that they can be with the data and information to to um, counter um, counterpoint whatever uh, the other side is saying. And same applies, right? If you if you are in a district where you have a split and you already know the Republican member and they're a great ally, but you don't know the Ds, then you kind of figure out where the relationship building is more um, more valuable to you. Okay. So if there's no more questions, we'll go to. Um, we're not going to spend too much time on this graphic, but you know, we're talking about bills and how they become laws. It's a very, very um, thorough process. And an idea before it can actually be signed into law has to go to many steps. And that's by design created this way so that folks can really analyze and spend the time needed and not just, you know, come in and, and do laws uh, left and right. So the idea for a bill can come from different areas. It can come from an individual citizen. It can come from a group such as the housing coalition. It can come from a legislator themselves because they had an anecdote or experience and they just want to change the law. Um, a lot of times it comes from a previous law. You just need to clean it up. It was passed and now you realize that you had a, a implementation issue and we have to go and clean that up. No matter where the idea comes from, you absolutely need a legislator to take that idea and make it an official legislative proposal. So a senator or a House of Representative uh, member has to take that idea and run with it and introduce the bill. If, the, if it's, it starts in the House and it goes through the same process, um, all the bills or ideas that come from the House start with HB numbers. So it's HB 1120, HB, or sorry, not HB 1120, HB 2011, HB 2040. It's always going to be HB and it's always going to be starting with a number two, House bill to whatever. If it's a Senate bill, it's the opposite. It's going to be SB 1120, SB 1010 always uh, starting with Senate bill and then the number one. So the process is very thorough, like I mentioned, no matter where you started, you must go to a House committee or Senate committee for public testimony, for the bill to be debated, and for the committee, the, the committee to decide whether or not to advance it in the legislative process. The committee is where public testimony is involved. After the committee, you can still be engaged through the request to speak system. You can submit your position. You can meet with legislators, but publicly you don't have any other avenue in the legislative process to share your views on the proposal. So that's early on. And that's the only time the public is welcome actively to participate in it, uh, in the discussion. After it goes through the committee, it's then, if it passes, it advances to the full um, caucuses. So the Republican caucus will meet and the Democratic caucus will meet separately. They will have their staff present the bill and essentially a summary of what the committee hearing discussed. That's an opportunity for members to ask questions. Uh, the members that do not serve particularly in that committee to ask questions, get informed, see what the temperature is from their caucus. Is this something they're going to like? Is this something they're going to oppose? Then after it goes to the caucus, it goes to what it's here listed as House floor. And that's where all the members of the House will then debate it publicly. We, the public, cannot come and testify anymore. But that's where your emails, your phone calls can be useful because we can send emails to legislators and say, hey, please support Senate Bill 
12, 10, please, and these are the reasons why we support it, um, or please oppose. And we can also engage if you have a, a relationship with legislators in providing talking points. That's where, you know, if you have an ally, you still want to communicate with them because maybe they need help crafting the message for how do we oppose criminalizing homelessness? Um, how do we oppose um, creating or, or uh, uh, sweeping the housing trust fund? Why do we do this? So that's, we're engaged, but not directly. We provide information and you can still provide information, but it's not a direct engagement at the house floor. Then once they discuss it, they have to take a full vote in the house. And again, most, most votes, um, unless it has an emergency clause or it's a new tax, all they need is a majority vote. So if they get 31 votes, it advances and it's sent over to the Senate where all those steps are repeated. And if they're successful, then you send it up to the governor's office and the governor will have, when we're in session, the governor will have um, up to five days to sign, veto or take no action in a bill. Bills can become law without the governor's signature if she doesn't veto them. Uh, it's very rare that that happens. And usually it would happen because they don't want to, essentially they're allowing the law to become um, effective, but they don't want to directly associate with it. It's, it's almost, I mean, I've seen it only a, a I want to say one time under Governor Ducey happened. So it's very, very uh, random for that to happen. Typically, they're going to sign our veto. If it's veto and the legislature disagrees, they have one more shot. They can override the veto of the governor if they have two thirds votes. So the House would have to come up with 40 votes, the Senate with 20 votes, and they can override the veto. I've never seen that happening in the last 12 years. Um, but it is an option available because again, you have separate branches of government. Um, usually the governor vetoes, she will provide an, a letter um, outlining the reasoning. She doesn't have to, it's a courtesy really to the legislature, but once she vetoes or signs, there's no further explanation she has to give. So who are the key players involved in the legislative process? Well, you uh, have policymakers, that would be the actual legislators. You also have their staff. So they're not policymakers themselves, but they're key advisors to the representatives and understanding how much workload they have on so many topics. The staffers tend to be very influential in this process. And another reason why they're influential is because we have a thing called term limits. So legislators can only serve up to eight years and then they have to either switch chambers. So a representative would have to go to the, to the House or sorry, to the Senate or vice versa. And because of the term limits, we lose a lot of people, uh, legislators and institutional knowledge is gone with them. Therefore, um, and of course, they also have higher aspirations, right? You have folks who want to run for Congress or governor or whatever it may be. So they leave office. Staff tends to stay for longer. So you build, you know, they're the ones holding more institutional knowledge. So they're very important to, to connect with and, and keep informed in the process. They're not the ones taking votes, but they are very influential. Um, of course, you have advocates, and advocates can come in very different ways. You can be an individual, just a, a, a citizen who wants to be engaged and make their voice heard. It can be an organization like ours who wants to make sure that our issues are top of mind for legislators. It can be businesses, corporations. There's a lot of interest that, you know, government regulations or deregulations would impact their day-to-day -day business. You can be contract lobbyists like myself who work with an a, a entity or association um, to advocate on their behalf. And of course, it can be community leaders um, and they also come in many different ways. So then you have the executive. So here, that's a typo. We clearly now have Governor Hobbs uh, and she has here the veto, veto stamp. 
but the executive is very influential. We, see, we have seen that in the last three months. I mean, you can go through all that process at the legislature, and if you don't have her say, um, it can be all for nothing. So it's a very, very influential um, seat. They, it's not only the governor, you also have other statewide elected officials uh, that have key roles in, in policy making. And then of course, agency directors, right? You have agencies like the Department of Housing, Department of Economic Security, Department of uh, Health and, and Human Services. All these departments and agency heads, they are in ways as well advocating for their own issues, advocating with the governor, advocating with the legislature, uh, making sure that their top of mind concerns are being addressed. So there's a lot of, of players um, for us as, as advocates, it's really, you, our role is to work with both the policymakers and the executive um, agencies as well. And I, that's all I have for today. Lourdes, I'm gonna ask a question that has come up in conversations with members because obviously a, a lot of our members are in nonprofit organizations and we wanna be sure that there's an understanding of how much latitude a nonprofit has either as an organization or a staff member mm -hmm. to support specific legislation. Yes, so for nonprofits, if you're a um, nonprofit, issues you can absolutely get involved. Um, what you are not uh, allowed to get involved in is political matters. So you're not supposed to endorse um, a political candidate or get involved directly on um, campaigns, political campaigns, right? You're, you're not supposed to give your logo. But if you're a nonprofit and your focus is on um, eviction prevention, you can absolutely get engaged in the legislative process and provide your input to that. So that's that's really the um, the avenue you have to make your voice heard. You're getting lots of accolades in chat, which is wonderful. Are well, there other you. questions or comments from folks? I've, I've got a quick question, uh, kind of following up on that last question. Uh, when you say issues you can be involved uh politics don't you can't be involved for nonprofits and nonprofit employees um does that cover um supporting supporting specific bills you can you can do right uh it's it's just uh the or, or, or perhaps a referendum you can support, but it's just the the candidates you can't support. Yeah, is that is a, correct? It's a, it's a candidates that you cannot support. So it's really, um, and I, I don't know if you can see my screen here, but this is a document that the Housing Coalition put together and it's really targeting those do's and don'ts, right? So you, um, I think the, the line is, is drawn where political and policy. So when you have a candidate who's campaigning, once they get elected, they start governing. So you as a nonprofit can get involved in the governing aspect of it um, for policy decision makings, um, for issues, concerns, but not for directly supporting or, or opposing a candidate running in legislative district three, or you can, as a nonprofit, you can go and say, um, I endorse candidate Katie Hobbs to become governor, right? You cannot do that. Now, once Katie Hobbs becomes a governor like she did, and she's saying, I want to put $150 million to the house and trust fund, you as a nonprofit can go and say, yeah, I support that issue that the governor's pushing for. Michael, did you have any follow-up questions or did that cover what you were looking for? That, that covered it, thank you.
And we've got a question in chat about, can you clarify with regard to nonprofit organizations versus nonprofit employees? Yeah, an employee. So ultimately, if you're, when you're advocating, that's a great question, because um, when you're advocating, you should be clear as to are you advocating on behalf of your organization or are you advocating on behalf of yourself? Nonprofit employees, like any other Arizona citizen, have the same rights for civic engagement um, over, you know, civic en engagement um, aside from voting. So you as an individual, so Linda works at the Housing Coalition. Linda has all rights to come as a citizen to the state legislature and share Linda's views on the housing trust fund. What she has to be very careful and clear is when she's speaking or meeting with folks is to determine, these are my views as a constituent, as an Arizona citizen, versus these are my views on behalf of the housing coalition. Those, those two are very separate. And um, we spent, a, a lot of folks are engaged by serving in different boards um, at, at different levels. That's another important thing, right? When you're on a board, usually you're going to go through some training that is going to tell you, okay, you got to be clear not to misrepresent the board's uh, views or points uh, in comparison to your own individual views and points. If I can ask another follow-up question to that. Yeah. Um, so when when doing that, say you're you're speaking uh, in committee or or something like that, um, and and you want to be clear that you're speaking as a private citizen, is it okay to you know say I work for this organization as a, a developer or a a uh, social worker or whatever i am on this board to to mm -hmm. establish yourself but but clarify that you're you're speaking pri as as a private uh yeah. person or that's that's fine or don't that's, even confuse it no that's absolutely fine um when you use a request to speak system um if you are not a registered lobbyist like i am you are not going to have the option to indicate the you know the organization that you're with. Um, if your organization has a register, they tend to have folks who they identify who can speak on behalf of their organization. And when they use the request to speak system, they get the option to say, I, like for example, I will say Lourdes Peña Housing Arizona Housing Coalition. That's how it's going to show. But I can also go in and say Lourdes Peña self. I never do it because I'm a contract lobbyist, but individuals uh, working on nonprofits will usually just show us uh, Michael uh, Smithson and self. And then when you go and introduce yourself and make your public comments, you're definitely, they, they will ask you for the record to show, to, to speak and say who you are and who you're speaking on behalf of. So you can say, I'm speaking on behalf of myself, but this is who I am, this is what I do, and establish that expertise. Thank you. Okay. There, there yeah. was a question about the do's and don'ts that you just posted. And yes, we've got that teed up to go into the follow-up email. So you will receive a copy of that. And hey, thanks to Jamie on our team for getting that pulled together. Yes, big thanks. <laughs> so that's, you know, that's a very clear um, do's and don'ts. But uh, again, there's there's always more. And as uh, the Housing Coalition, uh, you know, they're not, nobody here is providing legal advice. So if you have more questions, concerns, reach out internally to your folks as well. And we have a comment that Jamie rocks. Yay. We agree. So, <laughs> next is uh, my understanding is that nonprofits can't spend more than 20% of their budget on lobbying. Most of us don't come close to that. I think the chances of getting in trouble are very overblown. Would you like to comment? Yeah, so that that comment is regarding um, your tax uh, tax filing and tax uh, requirements. Yeah, most, most often than not, 
nobody's going to get close to that amount. Uh, nonprofits absolutely have a role in, in lobbying and advocating um, The you know, I think it's, um, it, it's becoming more and more, um, I, I mean, I think technology and just access to the process where we see more active um, nonprofits. And I think yeah, you definitely have a role. You also don't have to have a contract lobbyist uh, to be part of the process and to be actively engaged. Your executive directors or your leadership teams can, can be part of it, or they can designate a person within the nonprofit and say, okay, we, we want you to be the one um, uh, advocating on our behalf. And you absolutely can do that uh, without, without concerns, really. Public entities, I know we have public members as well. Public entities can also have access to this and get engaged, you know, cities, schools, uh, they can all participate. Typically for public entities, it gets a little more um, uh, challenging because you're, you're, you are definitely, again, like for nonprofits, are not supposed to be politically engaged. So you cannot use public resources to advance a political candidate, for example. But you can use your public resources to advocate, to contract uh, with lobbyists, or to dedicate a member on your staff to be um, working uh, on your behalf advocating at the state capitol or at the federal level. All this also applies to the federal level. Any other questions, comments? I don't see anything in chat. So I'm going to take the opportunity to say thank you, Lourdes. We appreciate your time. We appreciate your expertise. You are a good person to keep us on track and remembering how important each of our voices is because there is so much expertise among the coalition and we want to make sure that that expertise makes it to the ears of our elected officials. Absolutely. And thank you for uh, giving us a chance to be a partner with you. Um, again, not everyone here will participate, but we, for those participating, we do have a legislative day at the Capitol where we will be advocating for the legislative priorities. Um, and the top of mind, those, those priorities include a significant increase to the housing trust fund. We're supporting the governor's ask for $150 million one-time spending for the housing trust fund uh, with no earmarks uh, because we know that's flexible and a great tool to address the continuum of housing. Um, in different ways. And then second, we're also advocating for the continuing and expansion of the state low-income housing tax credit, which is the best proven tool available for housing um, to develop housing and, and make sure that that housing, those housing units are affordable and, and attainable for our constituents. And um, of course, there's a lot of other priorities that members are pushing for and we are supporting as well as um, defense. There's always defense that we're involved in and, and how do we make sure that we are um, providing relevant information to policymakers as they are uh, engaged uh, in different proposals. So thank you everyone. Um, thanks for all the work that you do. We'll share this uh, PowerPoint and, and you can follow the hyperlinks. If there's other questions, information that you would think is helpful, uh, please provide us the feedback and we can um, provide additional information. Thank you, Lourdes. Thank you, Lourdes. Thank Thanks, everyone. We'll see some of you next week at the Capitol. Have In the meantime, one. keep advocating. Yes.